Today is provided by Marshall University, with more than 100 degree programs offered in four locations and online. More about the Marshall family at marshall.edu. Good evening from the Capitol Building in Charleston. I'm Suzanne Higgins, and this is the Legislature Today. And joining me for this week's Rewind are Brad McElhaney of West Virginia Metro News, Lacey Pearson of the Charleston Gazette Mail, and Stephen Allen Adams of Ogden Newspapers. Hello to all of you. Hi. Hello. Hi, Suzanne. We're going to start. Um, we're going to start with Senate Joint Resolution Eight and Nine, and both of these could ultimately ultimately lead to changes in our state constitution when it comes to property taxes. Uh, let's first start with Resolution 8, which would uh, allow property taxes for those large manufacturers to be cut. Um, uh, we're going to catch up to where the bill is right now, but earlier this week, of course, a lot of uh, remarks on the, the Senate uh, floor midweek. For our radio audience, we want to let them know that you will be listening to, first up, Senator, um, Senator Charles Trump, Senate Judiciary Chair uh, of Morgan County. Then we'll hear from Senate Majority Leader Tom Takubo of Kanawha, Senator Paul Hardesty, Democrat from Logan County. I would not favor doing anything to the Avalorm tax on machinery, equipment, inventory, motor vehicles. We've talked about that too. Uh, if we can't find a way to protect county school boards, county commissions, municipalities who rely on that for their operations. But because it's hard doesn't mean we can't do it. Because it may be difficult, Mr. President, doesn't mean we shouldn't rise to the challenge and try to figure out a way to do it. Every law, every bill, I think there has to be a component of common sense to this. And when I drive in any direction, east, west, north, south, and you look at the flat land, you look at the, the different things that those states have that give us, give them a leg up on us, uh, when you throw a extra heavy tax on any manufacturer that comes in, why in the world would he choose or to come here? I mean, that's just uh, the, the common sense piece of it. And I think every piece of legislation, you've got to look at the common sense piece of it. If, if I'm a company and I'm going to have to pay a heavy tax in every state around, or uh, not pay a tax in every state around us, but you do us, that's a major inhibitor. But let's stop for a minute and reset. The reason that we're not growing businesses in West Virginia is not because of the business climate. It is because we rank so terribly in other very important sectors. According to U.S. News and World Report, we rank number 48 in health care, number 50 in economy, number 50 in infrastructure. Now, we rank 17th in business climate, and we're wanting to help them more. Should we not reset and focus in the areas that where we're so distraught and depressed? We've got it backwards. We've got it completely backwards. And these are the pros and cons that we've heard about Senate Joint Resolution 8 uh, for a couple weeks now. Brad, try to bring us up to date where these are. Senate, th this is Senate Joint Resolution 8, and then there's something very related, Joint Resolution 9. Right, and so you can hear the very practical things that they're talking about. Uh, would these resolutions promote manufacturing growth in West Virginia? Would it encourage more employment? And on the other side, would reducing that tax base uh, have very direct effects on counties, on school systems, on volunteer fire departments? Because these property taxes in general uh, go to counties and, and county school boards and, and support uh, local efforts. But although their conversation is very practical, what we're talking about here is, uh, if you take a step back, changes to the state constitution. Uh, property taxes are embedded in the state constitution, and so this actually would result in an amendment, or maybe a couple of amendments, to go to the voters that would simply allow the legislature to tinker with 
that aspect of the Constitution. Uh, so, so first they have to achieve the ability to do it by the voters giving them permission. And only then, probably next year or sometime in the future, would they actually act on it. But what you hear is, you know, on down the line, what effect would it have? Uh, one of those bills, there are two related resolutions. Uh, one would be property taxes on manufacturers. The other would hit your home. It would be property taxes on motor vehicles. I think the motor vehicles one is a sweetener for the other. You, you'd say, uh, yeah, I'd take away my tax on my car. I'd like that. And maybe we'll deal with your manufacturing tax also. Uh, so the one on vehicles was dealt with in Senate Judiciary this week. Uh, that now goes to Senate Finance. Uh, and the other one hasn't actually been taken up yet, but it's been debated thoroughly. And again, it would need two-thirds votes, uh, two-thirds uh, majority, or, or saying uh, yes, two-thirds. In each house. It would have to pass by two-thirds, is what I'm trying to say, and, and then it goes on to the ballot. Very much in doubt here in the legislature to achieve that two-thirds mark, but then would also have to be passed by the voters. All right. Um, Stephen, there's a bill, House Bill uh, 4025. This would change uh, publication requirements of, of, public legal, uh, of public legal notices and in a significant way. Tell us about that. Yes, that bill uh, just came up in committee. It's still waiting to come out of the House uh, Judiciary Committee. Uh, currently, there was a subcommittee that I went to. And basically what it would do would be right now if you got a class two or class three legal ad you have to put them in the papers in the areas that deal with the issue that that you have the ad for for a period of two weeks three weeks uh, every week at least once if this bill were to pass it would create a new website it would be managed by the state auditor's office and what would happen is if you have to put in a legal ad you can either do what's legally required currently, or you could put that legal ad in on the website and only have to put it in a newspaper one time, as long as it's on the website. This is causing a lot of concern, particularly with smaller newspapers. I mean, newspapers all around are concerned about this, but small newspapers, particularly your community weeklies, and right now every county has at least one newspaper, whether it's a daily or whether it's a weekly paper, and communities rely on this, and they rely on some of the revenues for these uh, from these legal ads. But there's also the argument that not everyone has uh, internet access, and, and so you're pointing everybody to uh, a website, and that's really not feasible for, I think the statistics in the committee were something like 27% of West Virginians don't have internet access. The broadband issue is one of the big issues with it, but even more remarkable with that, and this was brought up by Don Smith, the president of the West Virginia Press Association, Legal ads, once this bill, if this bill is passed, could become a political football. For example, if you want to curry favor with your newspaper, if you're a county commissioner, for example, you might want to put a legal ad in all three weeks and not put it on the website. If you want to punish a newspaper for an editorial stance, you might want to put it on the website. Also, if you've got an issue where you're trying to pass a levy, for example, and that's going to raise taxes on people, you might put it in the newspaper once and put it on the website that we're talking about here, and you know your community only sees it once, and then it's buried on a website. I mean, the whole issue with it is it's taken away public notice under the guise of transparency. Okay, and where, where does it go from here? Is it still in committee? What? Uh it, it, look, it looks like it's going to come back possibly at some point next week. As I said earlier, our subcommittee made a couple minor changes that would delay its implementation ultimately till 2023. Uh, if that is successful and it comes out of uh, committee, uh, it should, I believe, it goes straight to the House floor from there, or, if, or maybe it goes to judiciary. But once it comes out of there, it's got to do like deal with a House floor vote. And the thing that you got to remember too is there's a lot of rural legislators that might be taking a hard look at this and concerned about its implications. All righty, Lacey, um, I know that you've been following for the uh, Charleston Gazette Mail the, um, the, the bill that would establish an intermediate court system above circuit, below supreme. Uh, uh, tell us what, what this uh, court is, is all about. So right now, the way that the court system works in West Virginia, um, 
as it pertains to the intermediate court, um, there are circuit courts, which is kind of the county level court where you have criminal proceedings, family court proceedings, um, you know, divorce, child custody, that kind of thing. Um, so, and then the way it works right now, if you don't like the ruling that happens in the civil or in the circuit court, it, you can appeal it to the state Supreme Court. So what this bill would do would make an intermediate court, which as the name suggests, is in between those two courts. Um, but not all cases would be appealable to the intermediate court. Um, criminal cases would not be appealable. Certain um, child neglect cases would be or would not be appealable. Um, but civil cases would go. Um, so it creates an intermediate court. And then from there, if you wanted to appeal an intermediate court decision, it would be up to the Supreme Court's discretion. They wouldn't have to take every appeal. So it would drastically change the way the appeals process works in the state. All right, we have some um, clips, some of the uh, discussion earlier this week. This is from the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, we'll hear in the order in which they spoke. Uh, and again, these are just uh, excerpts <coughs> of what remarks were made. We'll first hear from Senator Richard Lindsay, a Democrat from Kanawha County, Senator Mike Romano, Democrat from Harrison, and Senate Majority Leader Tom Takubo of Kanawha County. So all this intermediate court does is create a barrier for consumers and people who are injured, people who you share the grocery line with, people who you share pews with. Thankfully, it's not a, a great number of people. But people nonetheless in all of our communities that make up all of our constituencies, not one, and I just got elected in 2018 and I knocked on thousands of doors, not one person said to me, you know what we need is we need an intermediate court. I've attended business roundtables. I've gone to all types of forums. No one has said we need an intermediate court. I just want to say to my colleagues across the aisle that, that this flies in the face of the philosophy that you espouse. This is the creation of additional regulation and additional government at a very steep price. Not just the price you see here in dollars, but as we spoke today and you heard from council, that everybody's going to have to deal with the additional costs and the additional time of the second layer of appeals. I bring this out because you're going to have to answer to your constituents. Because your constituents are going to ask you why you voted for this bill. Is it going to be the promise of more jobs again? with the way we give away taxes, the, that we've given away tax revenues in the past five or six years and no new businesses have come into this state. We've lost 50 some thousand plus people in the last five years. How are you gonna answer that? The U.S. Chambers and other uh, business entities has clearly uh, indicated that they feel this may be a very important tool in the toolbox. It's not the end all be all, but it could be an important piece of the puzzle. And the more pieces we can get together, the more likelihood uh, I believe we could get West Virginia going in the dire right direction, and uh, I certainly won't be here in 10 years, I'm sure, but um, I'm sure future legislatures, if we are wrong, if it turns out not to be, I'm sure they could uh, repeal this, but if we are correct, it certainly could help move West Virginia further along, and for all of those reasons, and I appreciate all the discussions I've heard, because I truly believe I agree with all of them, uh, feel this is the right to move in the right direction. Lacey, this is the third year that the Intermediate Courts proposal has, has tried to get through um, the legislative session. Tell us where it is now and what the chances look like it for this, this time. So following the meeting that we um, just heard from, uh, the bill was referenced to the Senate Finance Committee. Um, it certainly has as much chance as it has the past two years of passing the Senate where it gets stalled as in the House, so we'll just have to wait and see again for the third year in a row if the House decides they want to take this bill up. Terrific. Um, uh, Brad, we heard from the West Virginia National Guard, the RISE program. Uh, today, the numbers are another two of those homes have been um, completed. Uh, they state in their press release that there are 370 active cases under RISE currently. Now, this week, House Bill uh, 4130, which um, it, it addresses the competitive bidding process uh, for government construction contracts. Uh, this is related to the RISE program. Uh, tell us what the bill does and what that committee hopes it will do. Yeah, that's a bill that actually has been discussed for months going back to uh, special sessions last year. And it, it, it is intended to increase competition among the construction companies that provide these homes. Uh, as you said, there are uh, 300 some still out there, uh, most of them already under contract, but uh, this, this 
process has been much slower than anyone would like. Uh, these are people who are still trying to get into their homes after the 2016 flood. And unfortunately, only just a handful of companies have provided the service of, of, of getting the homes in place. They, they say right now there are only four. Only, only four, four, and of those, the vast majority are this company Thompson Construction mm -hmm. out of North Carolina. Uh, so the aim of that bill is to try to make it more competitive and to get more construction companies in line to build homes and, and get this thing moving just a little faster. Okay. Stephen, House Bill 2433, um, that would, would have set parameters around the school calendar, the public school calendar. A, a significant amount of debate on this. It, it got through relatively easy um, through the Education Committee, got to the floor. Um, we, we've got some back and forth that we'll listen to. I know that you, you've reported on this. We'll pick it up in just a moment. First, we will hear an excerpt from Delegate Eric Nelson, Republican of Kanawha, then Delegate Paul Espinoza, Republican of Jefferson County, Delegate Robert Thompson, De Democrat from Wayne County, and then an excerpt from uh, Delegate John Kelly, Republican of Wood County, who closes the debate. It was his bill. You know, it's very problematic having a tight schedule with anything, given the different geography that has been mentioned in some of our counties. This body, over the last couple of years, has continued to make an effort to push local control. Local control. And locally, we all, all our counties, vote on Board of Educations. And so if a county doesn't like what a board is doing, that county can make that choice. Essentially what we're saying with, a, with an affirmative vote of this legislation is that uh, school districts, you can take your calendars and we want a seminal piece of legislation, one of the seminal pieces of legislation that we're going to enact this session to be West Virginia House is trying to limit counties' freedom to set school calendars. Well, if you want to vote for that, you're going to do it without mine. I've had literally unanimous support from the people in my district. Not a single negative response uh, to this bill. Not a single one. Literally hundreds of responses, social media emails from people in my district in favor of this. And I might add that it passed almost unanimously out of the House Education Committee, which is comprised of a lot of school personnel, teachers, uh, service personnel, administrators, the people who arguably would know the most about this situation, they were in favor of it. Who supports the bill? Parents support the bill. I haven't talked to a parent in my district that doesn't want this bill passed. Teachers want this bill passed. I haven't talked to a teacher in my district that doesn't want this bill passed. Students are all for this bill. They want this bill. They want it passed. Members of the State Board of Education are supportive of this bill. They want it passed. Stephen, I, I was surprised at how close the, the vote was. Yes, it was 47-50. This is uh, Delegate Kelly's second attempt to do this. They tried to do this last year, made it the second reading, then got put on the inactive calendar. So this is their second attempt to do this. And this has been a battle for a number of years uh, since it first became a law in 2013. The issue was whether you know you want to give counties local control to set this or whether you want to try to limit it to a certain extent to help teachers, help parents plan a little bit better. And it's one of those issues that's probably going to keep coming up in the next several years. It okay, came up the very next day. There was an attempt to redo that vote and the, the attempt failed. Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't, I didn't know that one. Um, Lacey, House Bill 2419, uh, also uh, up for a, a vote uh, this, this week. This is one of several uh, of the criminal justice bills that uh, Chairman, uh, Judiciary Chairman John Schott really wanted uh, to get through. Tell us what the in intent of the bill was. Well, it's like you said, it's a bail reform bill, so we're talking about the point um, after an arrest that you often see on TV news where somebody's walking through a hallway in handcuffs and they get arraigned before the magistrate. What this bill does is require magistrates give what's called a personal recognizance bond, which is, which is essentially to release somebody without them having to pay any money or put up property, as long as they're charged with certain nonviolent misdemeanors. Um, if the person's charged with a crime where the victim is a minor, if it's a traffic incident involving injury or death, 
or any sort of drug misdemeanor, then the magistrate is required to set a bail. Um, but the goal of the bill is to um, reduce overcrowding in regional jails and to help um, drive down the jail bills that some counties are nearly millions of dollars behind on. Well, we have a, a clip of um, Judiciary Chair John Schott uh, giving more testimony why this bill is important. Let me just say that I think this is a component of our effort to reform our criminal justice system. It's not a magic bullet. It does, and I think we'll have an impact on the regional jail bills that uh, affect all of the counties uh, if, if, it, if it is implemented as we intend. Uh, it also addresses another challenge that faces us. You know, we can give the counties more money to pay the regional bill, but that doesn't do anything as far as addressing the overcrowding problem that faces our um, DMAPs, our, our Division of Corrections. So this, although not perfect, and certainly doesn't go as far as some folks want it to go, it is a good bill. It makes a step. It gives us a step in the right direction. We can always refine it, just like we have our second chance legislation and other legislation as, as time goes on, and we have experience with it. But I think it's a a good bill to, that moves us in the right direction of reform of our um, pretrial release processes. I urge its support. And, and Lacey, now this goes to the Senate. It does. Where. Um Senate Judiciary Chairman uh, Charlie Trump has said that he's generally open to reforms like this, but he wouldn't speak one way or another about how, how he feels towards this bill. Okay. Brad, the Mountaineer Impact Fund um, saw some attention this week. Tell us what it is and, and the, uh, you know, the thoughts around that. Well, first of all, we're going to need to devote an entire program <laughs> to explaining this one. But it is, it's, it's a fund that could or could not use state dollars, but essentially it's meant to help the state partner with sources of capital from outside, whether it is uh, from a corporation or from a sovereign investment fund from another company. Uh, why would it be necessary, you say? Why couldn't they just invest in what they want in West Virginia? Uh, that partnership potentially would allow West Virginia to guide the other entity or entities through the state's uh, regulatory system but also it potentially could provide some cover, but by the state putting its name on a project and, and the investor providing the money, uh, some certainty from federal oversight. Uh, so in other words, the state would be putting its stamp of approval on potential investment projects. Uh, this is a priority bill for House Speaker Roger Hanshaw, who is the only one who understands it. Uh, but it came out of... Uh, but it is bipartisan. I it mean, is it bipartisan. The Speaker called in, for example, uh, House Minority Leader Tim Miley, uh, Mick Bates, who is the top Democrat on finance, explained it to them and, and they understood it well enough and were assured enough to buy in. Uh, it passed out of House Finance this week and will hit the House floor with amendments as soon as Monday. All right, we just have a, a moment. What are we looking at uh, for next week? Real quickly, Brad? Well, that, that bill for starters, because it's the Speaker's priority bill, and Lord help anybody who tries to amend it because it's complicated. And Lacey? Um, I would like to, I'm going to be following um, Senate Judiciary Resolution, or Joint Resolution 7. Um, it's sort of another ripple effect of impeachment from about two years ago where um, Senate leaders want to amend the Constitution to say that the courts can't affect legislative proceedings in general, not just affecting impeachment. So that's a big step compared okay. to last year. And Stephen? We'll still be watching the legal ad bill. That should come back up in committee at some point next week, and then we'll see where it goes from there. All right, Brad McElhaney, Lacey Pearson, Stephen Allen Adams, thank you so much. And before we close this evening, it was Agriculture and Conservation Day here at the Capitol. Randy Owe discovered what the homegrown concept is all about. Among the wide variety of displays promoting our state's farming and conservation efforts is the West Virginia Veterans and Warriors to Agriculture program. Designed to give back to veterans by offering a new purpose in life, the six-year effort has nearly 400 registered, and they want more. In 2020, the plan is to grow the program with an expanded education and training series, giving veterans flexible times to discover a wide range of agriculture avenues. Take different classes on a variety of different topics, anywhere from beekeeping, mushrooms. Um, you know, our first one that we've got coming up is on business and entrepreneurship. 
The continuing push to expand the West Virginia Grown brand involves everyone, from the agriculture commissioner to the backyard grower. Commissioner Kent Leonhardt says food that travels less is healthier, and growing the local food economy offers good health for all of West Virginia. It's good health for the citizens. The dollars stay within West Virginia, so it's good health for our economy. It's also good health for our you know, medical bills, so we can save money there. There's a plan to expand local farmers market sellers from weekend hobby to a more profitable homegrown business. Our state's Farmers Market Association wants to help seasonal farmers harvest something year round and get local West Virginia grown products in more places. We want to see them in grocery stores, we want to see them at the Capitol, we want to see them um, anywhere that you go and you can get food or other agriculture products. We want there to be West Virginia made. It's all food for Mountain State Thought. I'm Randy Yoey for the Legislature Today. Monday on the Legislature Today, a focus on West Virginia's veterans and related legislation. I'm Suzanne Higgins. For everyone here at West Virginia Public Broadcasting, thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend. Hi, I'm Todd Freimeyer, and I am your West Virginia Public Broadcasting Media Sales Associate for Northern West Virginia. If you'd like to know more about how your business or organization can sponsor this programming, please contact me at 304-556-4905. Help protect and sustain the programs the people you connect with watch on this station by becoming a sponsor today. Thank you. Roadshow Recut highlights incredible items at Rosecliff Mansion and new half-hour shows. The reason he had a custom suit designed is because 